please. Um, can I welcome everyone to this session on gender and everyday life? And just to begin with, I'd like to give a special welcome to Tomar Piketty. Uh, and he is the new centennial professor here at the LSE, and he's spending time with us today. So I just want to welcome him to the LSE. Uh, so I'm Diane Perrins, I'm director of the Gender Institute, and I was one of the contributors to the BGS special issue uh, on, um, on Thomas' work. Um, and I was highlighting the absence of gender in Thomas' analysis. And in response to my comments, Thomas, Thomas points out that uh, he discusses the significance of gender very much in relation to inheritance uh, and women's exclusions from these rights, and also emphasizes the importance of gender equality policies. But he also accepts, I think, that gender issues could be taken uh, further, and especially how different groups experience gender in different ways. And that's the purpose of today's interventions. We have three speakers. Um, I'll introduce each of them very briefly before they speak. Their biographies are in the program for you to study. And then we'll have a response from, from Toma, and then hopefully there'll be time for some discussion. So first up, we have Professor Stephanie Seguino from the University of Vermont, USA. Uh, Stephanie is a macroeconomist who focuses on the connections between gender equality and macroeconomic outcomes. And what she'll be doing then is broadening Piketty's lens by discussing intergroup inequality with a focus on gender and race. Stephanie, thank you very much. Um, slides. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to be here. I want to thank the uh, International Institute on Inequality for organizing this, and uh, want to thank Thomas Piketty for writing the book that he wrote. Um, Piketty has done an enormous service, in my view. Uh, to emphasize the tendency for unregulated capitalism to produce and reproduce and perpetuate inequality over time. Uh, what his work does, however, is makes clear that it, inequality is not inevitable and indeed is a deeply political process. It also therefore suggests the optimistic message that there is an important role for the state to play in reducing the degree of inequality. Uh, I want to focus on broadening Piketty's lens to including other forms of intergroup inequality, but I want to speak just a moment about this, the ebbs and flows of inequality that uh, Tomas Pick discusses in his book, uh, in, in, later in his book with regard to the more recent period. Uh, so for example, we've seen the, the, the sharp increase of inequality since the 1970s, and uh, there have been a number of arguments as to why that has occurred, whether it is due to, for example, uh, price Asset, pr asset price inflation or other factors. But in my view, one of the factors has been really the change in macroeconomic policy with regards to liberalization and globalization. And what that has done is allowed capital many more choices with regards to where to seek out profits, and in so doing has reduced the bargaining power of workers and greatly increased the bargaining power of capital. So far from being an inevitable trend, Inequality really results from these, specifically these kinds of macroeconomic policies. And I would argue that it's also not only an economic process, a political process, but also sociological and psychological. Uh, Alan Greenspan, uh, not known for being a sociologist himself, uh, nevertheless commented on this trend and dubbed the term the traumatized worker effect in response to the decline in wages and the slowdown in wage growth as a result of globalization. And that is that because firms can easily relocate, they pose a threat effect to workers who no longer even bargain for higher wages for, for fear that firms will relocate to other countries. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to expand this discussion to other forms of intergroup inequality, such as race and gender. Uh, they are also the result of very deeply embedded processes uh, that are social, psychological, political, as well as economic. And indeed, I think a more comprehensive way to look at race and gender inequality is that they are forms of economic stratification. Economic stratification really has two key mechanisms that produce in, uh, reproduce inequality. One is exploitation, paying somebody less than their worth, and the other is exclusion 
Uh, so for example, exclusion from access to property, ownership of property, or access to jobs. Uh, so far from being a, uh, l r the result of differences in individual capabilities or deficiencies, inequality uh, has, is, is in fact deeply embedded in these systemic processes. And in my view, one of the most important things for, for us to understand from this and work that has been done in the last 20 years by what I would call Koletskian macroeconomists is that inequality itself affects macroeconomic outcomes. Let me just see how to work this. Oops. So um, a lot of the discussion around Tomas's work has been about, the about R and G and their relative sizes. What I'd like to suggest and what a lot of research is suggesting in the last 20 years is that, in fact, not only does the growth regime, that is not growth itself, but the regime, the set of macroeconomic policies affect the, ine the degree of inequality, but inequality itself also affects the rate of macroeconomic growth. And uh, I'd like to give some examples of this in, in the areas of gender and race, just to give you a sense of how rich this work is. And because it enlarges for us the possibilities to develop policies that would actually reduce inequality over time. So I gave you an example of class inequality uh, and, uh, and the, what, what has contributed to the growth of class inequality, that, that is the decline in wa the wage share of income globally. Uh, many have argued, and uh, a number of macroeconomists have argued, that in fact because of the decline in the wage share of income, there has been insufficient demand to buy back what is produced, and that has led to a slowdown investment. Firms have therefore invested their profits in the financial sector, and we have gotten the financial perversions that we saw emerge in the financial crisis that began in 2008. Let me suggest some work that has been done in the area of gender inequality. Uh, and, and in particular, what the effects on economic growth are, that is, what are the systemic effects of gender inequality? There's a great deal of work that indicates that gender inequality in education has, uh, has negative effects on economic growth. And that is, if we close educational gaps between men and women, economies will grow faster. They'll grow faster for a couple of reasons. One is that, uh, that there's a, the underlying argument is that, that yeah, educational inequality in which women have less education in men means that we're under-investing in qualified females and we're over-investing in under-qualified males. So there should be an increase in economy-wide productivity. There's also a great deal of evidence that women tend to spend more on their children than men do. And therefore, the benefits are a long-term in terms of investments in children and long-run labor productivity growth. There's another body of research that says actually that gender equal inequality in wages is a stimulus to growth. So a different type of inequality has a different effect on the macroeconomy. And this evidence has been found in Asian economies and in general semi-industrialized economies in which women have been segregated into the export sector. Their low wages have made exports cheap. This has stimulated export growth. It has allowed countries to purchase foreign technologies, best practice technologies that has raised their, raised their productivity and stimulated growth. So the point here is that it is a complex, it's a complex story that inequality can work in different directions in terms of affecting economic growth. Um, let me say something about racial inequality. There's been much less research that has been done on the, the macroeconomic effects of racial inequality. There's been a lot of work done on the impact of economic growth on racial inequality, but not the reverse. But I'm going to suggest some directions for you. One is that, uh, that racial inequality leads to social conflict and can slow economic growth because it discourages investment, creates uncertainty, and so forth. Certainly, this must be the case in Baltimore. And in many cities in the United States today, and certainly in a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa in which there are ethnic divisions. Uh, there is also the possibility that racial oppression can stimulate growth. So this is an example of, of uh, stratification through exploitation. And US slavery is, of course, simply the, one of the, the strongest examples of that. Uh, so why is it important to distinguish between different types of inequality? One of the reasons is the trends are not all in the same direction. We've heard convincing evidence, and I, I, I think very, very convincing evidence, that inequality, class inequality has increased since the 1970s. Uh, on the other hand, what we are observing is greater gender equality in employment. It would be great 
If I had data for you on gender equality and in income or gender trends in income, uh, that data is sorely lacking. But certainly there is evidence that female wages relative to male wages globally have at least uh, uh, stayed the same, if not increased in some countries. And more imp and, and as significantly, women's a share of jobs or share of employment has increased globally. Uh, so let me just show you some data. Uh, so this is for 177 countries, and the blue line is the uh, employment rate of women divided by the employment rate of men in 1991. This is as far back as the data goes. Uh, and a ratio of one means that women are just as likely to be employed as men, and of course anything less than that means that men have an employment van advantage and so forth. And so what you see is that, that for every 100 men that were employed in 1991, 60 women were employed, or 62 women were employed. And that ratio has risen over the last 19 years, so that now that ratio is roughly 70%. So we've seen this increase in women's access to income over this period of time. But it has come at the cost, uh, in many cases, of men's jobs. So if, in this graph, what you see on the y-axis is this, the ratio of uh, the female employment rate to the male employment rate. And on the x-axis, you see the change in the male employment rate ratio. Well, what's significant here is what's in the upper left quadrant. And in, in those cases, you have greater gender equality, but in all of those countries, 140 out of 177, men's employment rate has declined. And so what you have is gender conflictive equality. Uh, number one, the, the, the decline in men's access to jobs is consistent with the decline globally of the, uh, the wage share. But as I said, at the same time, this is a very complex story because women's, in, because women's access to employment is rising. And one of, the, uh, one, of the things, one of the things that we're observing is extraordinary conflict in the gender system as a result of this. Uh, there's evidence that suggests or that shows that as men's unemployment rate rises, we, uh, domestic violence increases. And so we are observing this increase in domestic uh, violence rates in a number of regions of the world. Some interesting work done by Nata Duvery at the University of Galway has attempted to estimate the economic costs of domestic violence. So she recently did a study of Vietnam in which the domestic cost of the, 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 the cost in terms of GDP of domestic violence in terms of broken bones, broken teeth, lost days of work, children missing school, and so on and so forth, is roughly 2% of GDP. So this story of the, the complexity of inequality is, is, I think, something we are just beginning to wrap our heads around. Let me add some more complexity to this, and that is forms of inequality can, be, in fact, be competing. Uh, there's some evidence that gender inequality is greatest in ethnically homogeneous countries. So in other words, the bad news of capitalism, when there aren't alternatives in terms of ethnic minorities, tends to be shifted to women. We see this in the Caribbean, and we see this in particular in East Asia, which has some of the widest gender wage gaps in the world, despite the most rapid growth and the rapid incorporation of women into the paid labor market. On the other hand, in ethnically heterogeneous societies, gender is not the major problem. Rather, it is racial inequality, and here the bad news of capitalism tends to redound on those ethnically subordinate groups. Certainly, Brazil, the United States, and a number of other countries fall into this category. Um, so I want to just suggest that um, inequality is, is not inevitable. Uh, and that there are policies that can address it, but a focus on class inequality only misses important underlying dynamics. In my view, this research is really at its infancy. Uh, when I, I came through customs last night, and an immigration officer, when I told him what I was doing, he knew Thomas Piketty, and uh, he said, <laughs> Oh, inequality, that topic's been around for such a long time, at least 10 years. And, uh, <laughs> and I'm very happy that it has. Uh, but there is so much more to be done to understand the complexity of this, the, inter the, the feedback uh, loops between both the, the macroeconomy and inequality, but also competing forms of inequality and how we distribute the bad news of capitalism in hard times. Uh, and I would say that what our task is, is to define a set of policies that promote equity-led growth rather than growth that is stimulated by the, the, the perpetuation of interacting forms of stratification. Thank you.
thank you very much, Stephanie. And um, if you'd like to hear more of Stephanie's work, she will be speaking again on Thursday evening. Um, and now it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Nyla Kabir. Uh, she is Professor of Gender and Development at the Gender Institute here at the LSE. Uh, gender, um, sorry, Nyla has worked on uh, gender, inequality, labor markets, women's empowerment for many years. Uh, she is a graduate of the uh, LSE economics in the past, and um, she'll be talking about the challenge of intersecting inequalities. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, um, I'm picking up from Stephanie and talking about broadening the focus on inequalities to encompass what I'm calling intersecting inequalities. But I'm afraid I'm not starting with uh, Piketty's work. I'm going to start instead with something by Milanovic because it brings out a couple of statistics which I find useful to begin with. And that is he looked at, uh, I don't know how many countries across the world between 1988 and 2008, and he found that, as we would have uh, imagine from uh, Thomas's work, the largest increases in real income were at the top 5%, and in fact, it was the top 1% that saw its real income rise over this period by 60%. There were some increases lower down the income distribution, one of the reasons we've seen a fall in absolute poverty across the world. However, the exception was the poorest 5% who saw no change in their real incomes between 1988 and 2008. So who are the bottom 5%? Five, 5 Many of the bottom billion, and I think they overlap, live in low-income countries, as you might expect, Bangladesh, Congo, Tanzania, Ethiopia. But a, remarkable sh a remarkably large share of them are in the middle-income countries, India, China, Nigeria, Indonesia, and so on. And the reason is precisely what we are talking about today, that rising per capita GDP at rates sufficient to lift previously low-income countries into middle-income status, but not sufficiently widely distributed, sufficiently widely distributed to lift their populations into middle-income status. So many uh, people in these rising middle-income countries remain below the poverty line. And these are the people I would like to be focusing on today. So who are they? They are. We, we can uh, uh, tackle this issue or get a handle on this issue of the bottom 5% in a number of different ways. One is, of course, income inequality, and they are at the bottom 5% of that distribution. And income inequality is very useful in drawing attention to class divisions and to poverty and to economic deprivation. However, if we conceptualize inequality in terms of group-based identities, then we get uh, greater attention to social discrimination to the unequal treatment meted out to different groups on the basis of socially ascribed identity. So if income inequality focuses on what you have, social inequalities, or social discrimination focuses on who you are. These are distinct axes of inequality. You can be deprived without being stigmatized, and we have a, a, a distinction in development studies between the deserving and the undeserving poor. Or, as the contemporary UK uh, language has it between the workers and the shirkers, or the strivers and the shrivers, uh, or whatever. And you can face discrimination without going hungry. So women in particular are distributed across all income groups, and though they may face disc more discrimination than men from their groups, a lot of women in the upper income brackets are not going to go hungry. However, it is the groups at the intersection of these inequalities who are most likely to represent the bottom 5% and the socially excluded of their society. Those who we know when we look at growth rates and the declines in poverty are most likely to be left out and left behind in any progress made by their society. So while the identities in question can take many different forms, the most enduring forms are those that are socially ascribed from birth, that you, in a sense, inherit. Gender, race, caste, ethnicity. By their very nature, these forms of disadvantage tend to get passed along through generations. So while gender is a marker of discrimination, but not necessarily of deprivation, we find that gender exacerbates the impact of different kinds of inequality. So when we look at the very at racial groups, at ethnic minorities and so on, we find that women, by and large, tend to do worse within those groups. Not always, but by and large. So I'm going to give you a little bit, and I'm not going to go through all of this, but it's just a few statistics to let you know how this works. And the impact of intersecting inequality starts very early in life. So in Latin America, 
Children from indigenous groups are considerably more likely to die than those from other groups. Uh, 1.5 times more likely in Bolivia, Brazil, and Mexico, and over twice more likely in Ecuador and Panama. Panama. Their children of indigenous groups are also more likely to be undernourished. The intersection of gender, ethnicity, class, and location in Bolivia means that the average years of school education is highest for urban-based, non-indigenous men in the highest income quintile, and it is lowest for rural-based indigenous women in the poorest income quintile. We find it in India, and under five mortality is much higher amongst the caste, the marginalized castes and tribal groups. In Nepal, we find it in terms of child mortality. In Vietnam as well, people from the ethnic uh, majority, Kin and Chinese groups, were only 23% of those children were underweight, compared with 34% of those ethnic minorities in the northern mountains and 45% in the highlands. In South Africa, infant mortality risk is declining, but it is still four times as high amongst black African children compared to white after we call for control for relevant factors. And in Nigeria, child mal malnutrition is highest amongst the Hausa ethnic group and with the um, lowest amongst the Yoruba. So all in all, what it, and, and then finally, we see the operation of intersecting inequalities in labor markets. So in, in, in Latin America, indigenous and Afro-descendant women are more likely to earn poverty level wages than men and than women in the rest of the population. In Brazil, for instance, white men earn the highest incomes for each level of education in both 1996 and 2002, while Afro-descendant women earned the least. Gender gaps in education we find in casual labor wages. In India, women earn just 55% of the weekly wages earned by men, and only 28% of this gap is explained by their observed characteristics. And in uh, South Africa, poverty data for 93, 2000, and 2008 all show that the incidence and share of poverty was higher for Africans as a group than any other group, but amongst Africans, the incidence and share was consistently higher for women than for men. So, very briefly, these intersecting inequalities are reproduced over time by intersecting mechanisms that reinforce, overlap, and reproduce. One, of course, is cultural devaluation. And it is the way in which certain groups are stigmatized, invisibilized, stereotyped, ridiculed, and so on. So it becomes quite difficult for them to have a very strong sense of their own abilities. There's a very widely cited and quite rightly widely cited experimental study from India that shows us that children from different castes performed equally well in doing maze puzzles when their caste identity was not revealed. But the moment their caste identity was revealed, the performance of Dalit children <coughs> went dramatically down and even further down when they were segregated into different caste groups. A study from Nepal looking at empowerment and so on found that the upper castes uh, performed much better, as you might imagine, than the lower castes. But interestingly, 90% of the upper castes had not encountered any form of discrimination or intimidation. That 10% were mainly women. And of course, if you look across the population, Dalits, the lowest caste, performed least well in terms of empowerment, uh, you know, uh, uh, feelings of inclusion, and Dalit women did worse than everyone else. A second is discrimination in essential services. If you look at the distribution of health and education in India, it very much follows the distribution of religious and caste populations. The higher the proportion of religious minorities and castes, lower castes in a district, the less likely they are to have access to medicine and to education. And of course, the treatment that you get if you are from the lowest caste, people don't want to touch you, they don't want to treat you, you're at the, back, at the end of the queue. So it is not surprisingly that we find marginalized groups across the world tend not to want to take up social services. And in terms of education, I think I remember going to the World Social Forum in, in Delhi, and I shared a platform with children from minorities, and there was a little Muslim boy, he was about 10, and he said his teacher didn't like him and told him to go to the back of the class, because in the end, all he was going to grow up to be is a terrorist. And I thought, if there's one way to turn him into a terrorist, is by telling him that that's all he's going to be. So education reproduces the images and the aspirations that we have for ourselves. And then there is the economics of discrimination. We've seen how women from minority groups systematically earn less than everyone else. Some of this is act the discrimination applies across the board. 
But I think, as uh, Stephanie pointed out, a lot of it is concentrated amongst the, 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 the discriminated against groups, race, and so on. And it works in a number of ways. First of all, of course, in some cultures, in, in caste cultures, you cannot earn, inherit land. So most of the people from the lowest caste have no land. In other places, the only land you can get is of the worst quality. So indigenous groups in Latin America have very poor quality land. In general, women are crowded into a fewer percentage of jobs. And so they're competing against each other, and these jobs tend to be defined as of lower value and lower pay. One of the costs of this, I think, came up for me in Mozambique. I think I've got three minutes left. Uh, in Mozambique, young boys and girls from poor households drop out of school early because they want money. They need to earn money. Boys go off into trade. They go to South Africa. They earn a bit of money. What do girls do? The easiest job for them to do is sex work. And that means that while Mozambique has some of the highest HIV rates in Africa, it is four times higher amongst adolescent girls. So the economics of discrimination takes many different forms, but it does mean, and of course in the caste system, you are assigned to certain occupations, and these are less well-paid, dirtier, and more demeaning. And finally, of course, this all leads to denial of voice and influence. And if a group of people feel that they are systematically denied any say in the policies of their countries, one of the things they do is turn to conflict. So a great deal of conflict in recent times has been driven by forms of intersecting inequalities, ethnic discrimination. If we look at the Zapatistas, we know who they are and which regions of Mexico they came from. If we look at this low-level insurgency in India, which is the Naxalite movement, a high percentage of them, as the Maoist uprising in, in Nepal, are drawn from Dalit and other marginalized groups. So I'm going to finish very quickly by some very key some key pointers from, not advice, not recommendations, but you know, things that have worked and what they tell us about what might work. One is the importance of the discourse of rights. However, your, whatever your reservations are about the Western origins of rights and so on and so forth, if we look around the world, marginalized groups take recourse to the language of rights because of its promise of equality. Two is when we talk about transforming relationships between state and citizen, we also have to talk about transforming relationships between citizens. In other words, intersecting inequalities are reproduced through the attitudes that we all have to the other within our own society. So this is not just about a vertical sense of citizenship, but it is about new forms of sociality, new forms of respect for each other. Then, of course, universalism. We want to see universal policies, at least at basic services basic health, basic education. But universalism, we know, does not mean uniformity. We have to have certain forms of targeting in order that we make sure we reach the hardest to reach. So we need to balance this issue of sameness, equality, and difference and diversity. My last two points, we need to move from amelioration to transformation. That means we need to move. These are group-based disadvantage, and they need group-based solutions. Just trying to work out at the individual level and targeting individuals is going to be largely ameliorative and perhaps make things worse for people. This requires collective action and group-based action. But because there's a danger, if we focus too much on the identity politics side of things, that we further reproduce the, the, the otherness of stigmatized groups, I think the, 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 the politics of recognition, the struggles for recognition, must be located within a larger struggle for redistribution. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nyla. Our final speaker is Dr. Lisa McKenzie. Um, she is Research Fellow in the Department of Sociology here at the LSE. Uh, Lisa's recent book, Getting By, uh, was, not was not yet a US bestseller, but it was certainly The Guardian's bestseller uh, one week. And I think that fills a very welcome one gap week. in contemporary debates on inequality by focusing on the lives of people who live on uh, low incomes through detailed ethnographic work. Um, and, and those voices were distinctly lacking, I might say, or at least lacking representation uh, in the recent election. Uh, uh, today, uh, Lisa is going to focus on the politics of class, gender, and precarity. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to thank the Institute for Inequalities for inviting me um, 
among and to, to sort of speak amongst these eminent people you're probably wondering what I'm doing here and so am I so <laughs> um but I'm gonna what I also want to do as well is, is sort of thank uh, Thomas Piketty for writing a book on, on economics that I, I'm actually interested in reading. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's mainly because of its because of the narrative that runs right through it. And I'm an ethnographer, um, and I'm also a working class woman, which means that I speak in in narratives. I like stories, and so for me, Piketty's book was actually the only economics book that I've ever read, <laughs> and, <laughs> and um, understood, and actually enjoyed so for those of you like me today who don't who doesn't know what beta is <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna i'm gonna tell i'm gonna tell the stories of inequality um through pictures uh so where i want to start really is those of you who know this picture this is um hogarth gin lane and beer street now the concepts of inequality, um, poverty, have been around with us for a long time, but they're told in different ways, and they're also understood in different ways. Um, if you go on the next street from here, you can actually see these in the flesh. They're in the museum at the back. But this is really where I like to start, this, or, or where I like to start to think about inequality and what it means to me and the people that are involved in, in my research. Is this sort of discrimination, stigmatisation, this idea of this is who poor people are. You know, they're drinking, they're throwing their babies out with the bathwater, um, you know, chaotic, dangerous. So this is really where I like to start, because this is, this is what's in the, the public imagination. However, that's not where I'm going to leave it. Um, poverty, inequality in class has been addressed in many ways. But for me, what's always grabbed me is that narrative, that storytelling. And for me, that community studies has always been important for that. Because while um, the economists can address the big questions and look at the data sets of hundreds and thousands, for me, what I'm going to do is pull it right back and think about how inequality affects one woman or one man or one child or one family. Because those narratives and stories are really important. And they've been with us a long time. And these are some of the th this is these are some of the ways that poverty and inequality have been narrated over the years. Poverty, the Forgotten Englishman, which was um, an inspiration for me because it was about the council estate that I lived on. And when you live on a council estate, and then you read that actually where you live is interesting to people, it, it's 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 enlightening. Also, the family and kinship in East London. Um, from Michael Young and Peter Wilmot, which again, it's another narrative. It tells us small stories, but also what it does is enables me, and that's my book there, <laughs> it enables me to sort of trace back those narratives and stories. So because I don't use graphs and I don't use numbers, stories are really important to me. And then you've also got this sort of prurient poverty porn, this fascination with poor people, such as, such as Benefit Street. Now, we can't, you know, we can't ignore those stories and those narratives because that feeds right into inequality and it feeds into how people are seen and known, but also how they're treated as well. So we need to take all of these stories together. And that's what, I, that's what I argue for and I'll fight for, is detailed ethnographic research that's critical but also accessible. And actually, that's why I liked your book, because it was <laughs> accessible. <laughs> um, and I think today, this morning, you know, we've heard a lot about, you know, how inequality happens, what happens. Well, what I want to do now is just talk to you about the way that it feels. Um, now, this is a picture. I don't know if you can see it. And those of you who have seen it, I so, I'm sorry, but it really does. It, it, tells, it says something to me. It speaks to me, and I hope it does to you. This was a photograph that was taken by a group of respondents that were in my research. And we had, I had a camera, and I asked my respondents to take pictures of things that they liked in their neighbourhood. This is Nottingham. This is, this is taken from St Anne's in Nottingham, which is a council estate. Um, it's one of those council estates in the UK that you're not supposed to go to. It's full of drugs. It's full of single mums. It's a dangerous neighbourhood. Um, and I'm really sad to say, actually, that the sort of discrimination and, and not touching doesn't just happen in Mozambique and in India. It's actually those stories that are very relevant to me in the UK. 
So this is a story, this is a picture that some of my respondents took of the place that they liked. I just said, take some photographs of what you like in your community. And they looked over and they said, there's town, there's the city centre. And if you can see, you can see the landscape of the city centre behind it. And they, and they took the photograph and they said, there's town, we like town. There it is. We like the city centre. McDonald's is in there. And then when I got home and I looked at this photograph, it was only then that I saw the bars and the gates and the grills. And then when I started to really think, and this is what ethnography does, it puts things into context, the group of respondents were four three-year-old children. And I was with them on their first week at nursery. And we, I was asking them to take photographs of their community and the things they liked. And that they're in the school playground. So you're actually seeing the city of Nottingham through the school playground, through the, through the lens of three and four-year-olds who have lived in this community and will probably always live in this community. And how they see the world and how they see the city that they live in is through bars and gates and locks. And so for me, this is how I, this is how I try to explain and how I try to tell the stories of inequality because it's, it's important to feel it as well. Because feeling locked out or locked in, and I'm do, I still don't know what this is, but these are all over this council estate. And actually, if you look at all council estates, in the last 10 years, bars, gates, locks and gates have appeared all over. I'm not a social psychologist, so I don't know what, what happens when, this, when you live in this, but I'm sure that it's not positive. <laughs> And so what do I do? I talk about stories. Now, when I think about gender, I'm not, I don't just think about women. I also think about men. And also, where I'm from, which is in Nottingham, and actually all over the north, gender um, roles have changed. The role of inequality, the roles of poverty have changing. And actually, where women would have been less visible, and men, perhaps through trade unionists, through work, through industrialised um, spaces, may have been really visible. They're actually now becoming invisible, and women are becoming very visible. And there's two stories here that I'd like to say, I'd just like to talk to you about. This morning, I found out that wealth means that ev it means everything that you can sell on the open market. I didn't know that. So <laughs> what I'm going to do is, is talk to you about people who have got no wealth, but that doesn't mean they haven't got any value. And that's the distinction I want to make, that wealth and value shouldn't go together, and we should be arguing this. This is Tina. Uh, she works in the local community centre. She worked there for as long as I've known her, five or six years. She got up in the morning, went and washed the pots. This is a voluntary position. She's on benefits, um, housing benefit, income support, and she has two children. Um, it's a voluntary position. She doesn't get paid for it. She cleans tables. She washes pots. She talks to the old people. She talks to young mums. She's valuable. I think she's got a strong value in the community. In 2011, when uh, Ian Duncan Smith's welfare cuts came in, she was dragged into the um, Department for Health and Pension for, in the DHS, and she was told that because she did voluntary work, she could get a job, she should be working. So she was sanctioned. But don't worry, people, because the, the, the lovely job centre said that they were going to help her. They were going to help her find a job. And they did. They found her a job packing in a cheese factory which was about six miles out of the city centre. So she gets up now at six o'clock in the morning and leaves her two children, um, and she goes and packs cheese in a cheese factory, mainly with Eastern European people that she can't speak to. Because that, for somehow, means that she's valued more in our society than washing pots and cleaning tables in the community that she lives and she loves. This guy here is Tony. He's in his 60s. The only thing he's ever known is boxing. And he doesn't, he's, he's, he's got very ill health. But he, what he does is he goes into this gym every day and he teaches young lads how to box, and girls actually, he's taught me how to box. Um, but he also teaches life skills as well. He tells people, when, when you're in the ring with him, he shouts at you and says to you, don't look out there, there's nothing out there for us. Look in, because look in, you'll get hurt if you look out. So he's teaching life skills as well. 2011, you know what I'm going to say to you? They found out that he was volunteering in this gym, in this boxing gym, and he's sanctioned. But only he's, he's 60, he's, he's not got a job. He's now 
living off handouts from family, actually from his 93-year-old mum. This is what inequality looks like in Britain, and this is how it feels. And I just wanted to really start to put some meat on these bones. <sighs> That's Nottingham. This is London. And I've been here for nearly two years, and it's terrifying. It frightens me every day. And after this weekend, I'm more frightened than ever. Um, working class people all over the, U the, UK, the United Kingdom at the moment, have had, they've had a tough time. They've had lots taken away from them. Identity, pride, justice, politics, no one represents them. Here in London, the last thing that is important to them, which is community and each other, is being ripped away from them and taken. And their communities are being sold off and they are being cleansed out of this city. And when all you've got is each other and your identity is really based on your community, where you're from, and your family, taking that away is cruel and vindictive. And so what I've been doing for the last two years is really looking at homes and housing, and particularly around women in London. And it's not all bad news. Um, this is a occupied council house in Stratford uh, that the Focus E15 mums occupied. Um, what they were trying to do is show that there's been empty homes all over London. This particular council estate, uh, Stratford Council tried to flog it to uh, UCL um, as a campus, an overseas campus, a global campus. So the people that lived here, this working class community that had been there for 50 years, was actually moved out. Although they've occupied it again. Um, we're, we're not winning by any chance, really. It's very difficult, but we are fighting back. And at the, at the, at the centre of this fight back is women, women and children. And so really that's what I want to say to you today is men, I suppose, are less visible now. Their trade unions have gone. But what is happening is there's a politics of movement and it's happening in communities, in working class communities, and the strength is with women, with women and with children. This is women and children um, from Sweets Way, which is in North London. They don't know. Every day they think the bailiffs are going to come and throw them out. They don't actually know when the bailiffs are going to come and throw them out. But they stand and they fight every day. And this sort of politics of class, this identity of class, is happening. And there are movements happening. It's not in the mainstream. It's not about mainstream politics. But it is happening. So all I want to say really is leave you with is that inequality, as we know, moves and shifts. It changes, it's sneaky, and it, and it makes us believe that there's all sorts of other reasons. And also I just want to say as well that, you know, I stand in solidarity with all working class people in this country who are suffering at the moment, and the next five years is going to be tough. Thank you. Um, so based on Thomas' very stimulating work, we've heard about the different forms of uh, inequality, the different, how it affects different groups and how it's experienced. So I'd now like to ask Thomas to respond uh, to these <laughs> comments. Well, it's difficult to talk, especially after, after uh, Lisa's very uh, moving uh, intervention. I, I, le let me first apologize for arriving late. I feel really bad. You know, this is uh, the Eurostar was late, and, and usually the public uh, train service works better in my country than in Britain, but this time this was... <laughs> <laughs> this time, this was because of a, a technical problem on the French side. But anyway, uh, so le let me also thank uh, the LSC and Mike and, and the British Journal of Sociology and everybody who took part to the organizing this day and organizing the special issue of the British Journal of Sociology. I, this makes me you know, very, very happy to see, uh, you know, so many people from different disciplines, uh, um, uh, you know, many, many of whom have spent time reading my book and, and having now this discussion on inequality. I, I view, I, you know, I would like to view my work and view myself more as a work of a social scientist and a work of an economist. I think the boundaries between economics and history and sociology and 
anthropology and political science are, are not as clear uh, as what uh, economists sometimes try to pretend. You know, as you know, sometimes economists try to pretend that they have built a science that is so uh, scientific that the rest of the world uh, cannot understand. But this is uh, this is a big joke, as we all know. And and. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, you know, I think the profession is spending too much time sometimes, you know, into uh, uh, mathematical technicalities just to look scientific and to try to impress others. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that anybody is impressed, but I'm sure that this is... <laughs> I think this is a loss of time in many cases. I think, you know, simple mathematics or simple models or statistical techniques, of course, can be useful, uh, but complicated ones uh, usually are here for bad reasons, and, and uh, I think economists should spend more time uh, collecting data, uh, uh, talking with other fields, and, and most of all, being modest about what we know and what we don't know. And I think the bottom line in the social sciences in general is that we start from very low. We know very little. And I, am, I feel very close to what Stephanie said in her presentation, that the study of inequality is very much in its uh, infancy. You know, we, there are many dimensions of uh, inequality about which we know little, many countries in which we know very little. And, uh, you know, we, we have made a little bit of progress. And in my own particular case, I have made a little bit of progress. And I try in my book to, to make this material accessible to everyone so that everybody can uh, make their own mind and take this further. But we still know uh, very, very little about many, uh, many important uh, issues. To me, the most interesting effect of my book was the, the fact that it, uh, it induced a number of governments in a number of countries, particularly in Latin America, also in Asia, to open their uh, uh, data sources, in particular fiscal data, which I could not access before, so that at least we can uh, uh, we can uh, we can do work that we couldn't do before. Now, regarding the the issue of gender and and also racial inequality, which were uh, discussed in this um, in this session, let me be very clear that this is. You know, these are probably some of the most important issues which are not sufficiently addressed uh, in my book, uh, partly because of data sources issue, typically the historical data on income and wealth that we have been collecting is not broken down by gender. Typically the income tax data, at least the long run historical data, is not broken down by gender. But we could do a more. Still, with, uh, we are str and we are trying currently with Tony Atkinson and, and many other uh, colleagues to extend our uh, income inequality database in the direction of gender uh, inequality, uh, but, but you know, we should have done more in this direction. We are doing more now in this direction. The, the, the wealth data, also the historical data on wealth and inheritance involves a lot of, uh, includes a lot of very interesting information on gender inequality, which I have used a, a little bit in some other work with Gilles Postelvinen and Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, but, but which could Use, uh, which could be used a lot more in this, in this direction. L let me uh, mention two, two issues on, on which uh, uh, gender and also racial inequality does play an important role in my, in my book and, and, and uh, describe how this can interact with some of the points that were made during this presentation. First, one dimension in which gender inequality plays an important role in my historical narrative about wealth and inheritance is through um, the, uh, the demographic and, and fertility uh, dimension. So one, you know, one of the points I make in my book is that the uh, demographic, and in particular the number of children, plays a very important role in the long run to understand the relative importance of inherited wealth and labor income. So to put it very simply, in a society where you, everybody has 10 children, uh, inherited wealth is not going to matter too much, uh, and you should not count on inheritance too much. And uh, labor income is going to play a much bigger role in uh, accumulating new property, access property, simply because everything gets divided by 10 at every generation. And on the contrary, in a society where you have uh, uh, less than 2 or less than 1.5 children per, uh, per family, uh, you know, if you get closer to 1, 
uh, in the extreme case where you have only one children in each uh, family, basically children inherit from uh, from both sides or, or from zero side if both parents are poor. And potentially this makes the relative importance of inheritance uh, in, in 2030 or 2040 in countries with declining population like China or Germany or Japan or the very different societies, maybe the importance of inheritance in these societies will be even more than at the time of Balzac in France. And in fact, one reason for the big importance of inheritance in France in the 19th century is the stagnation of population. But, but when you have a decline in population, we are entering a new territories. And, and of course, one of the reasons why uh, uh, men and women uh, don't have many children in many of these countries is because of, of uh, a conflict about uh, gender role and gender inequality. So typically, if women in, in, in Germany or Japan are being told that they should stay at home after they have children, well, a possible reaction is that they won't have children at all. And, and uh, so the issue of gender inequality uh, and policies to, to basically get men to do something with the children and get, get uh, uh, more egalitarian distribution of, uh, of, uh, of roles in society as is probably the most important, uh, uh, one of the most important issues for the future has huge consequences for inequality in general, in particular through uh, uh, demographic and, and ultimately this is very uh, uh, important for the overall structure of, uh, of, uh, of wealth and, and labor income and inequality uh, in, uh, in society. Um, and another issue I would like to, to, to point out is, uh, so racial inequality, you know, is, is not, is not uh, addressed, uh, of course, as much as, as it should in my book. Although I, I, I do spend, uh, uh, you know, part of the book looking at the importance of uh, slavery in the overall structure of wealth in, in, uh, in the 19th century, in particular in the southern part of the United States. I show how in slave societies the overall value of slave capital, you know, can be even bigger than the value of uh, land uh, uh, capital in, uh, in, in sort of traditional uh, European uh, patrimonial uh, uh, societies. Now, of course, uh, uh, racial discrimination did not stop with the end of, uh, of slavery. Uh, it's not legal anymore, but it still exists in, in different ways. And, and uh, uh, what, uh, what Neila told us about caste identity and the impact uh, on uh, uh, attitudes when, when people uh, were, uh, in particular, these this young uh, Indians uh, 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 students are aware of who knows about their caste identity is, is, uh, is something uh, extremely important. Uh, uh, you know, in, in, in my country, in France, uh, recent studies have shown that the, the level of discrimination toward uh, um, uh, students from uh, uh, North African or Muslim origin, you know, reaches proportion, which are just incredible to, 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 to believe. You know, the, the, when you do study where you send CVs to employers just changing the name and putting a North African sounding name. You know, it's not only that you get fewer interviews, is that when you go up in the hierarchy of possible CVs with the best possible degrees, the best possible work experience, the changing the origin of the name uh, basically kills any return to high degree and high experience. So it's even, the discrimination is even bigger when you are in the highest uh, achievement category, which is of course a way to completely destroy any uh, reasonable, uh, you know, incentive for achievement. Mm -hmm. uh, so so these this dimensions of inequality are, are absolutely, uh, um, absolutely crucial. And, and let me just conclude that, you know, I, I really believe in the complementarity uh, between uh, the different approaches to inequality, uh, you know, including the life story uh, uh, approach and ethnographic work, uh, uh, which, uh, which Lisa uh, um, uh, illustrated in their uh, in their intervention, uh, you know, in the in the 
my own materials that I use in particular in the inheritance record, you actually have life stories, or also these are, these are the life stories of dead people, and, but, but you know, through, <laughs> through the history of, uh, of wealth and who, you know, who you married, uh, whom, uh, whom uh, how you got your wealth, when did you uh, uh, sell or buy your assets uh, uh, from the family of your, uh, of your uh, wife or spouse, and, and you know, you have entire life that, 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 are, that are here in the historical material, but of course looking at, at uh, uh, you know, the life story of uh, a life individual is, uh, is uh, tell, tells you even even more. Uh, so all, all these approaches, I think, are complementary. And uh, let, you know, let me just conclude that I am, you know, I'm very glad to be here, for especially with the foundation of this new uh, interdisciplinary uh, research center uh, on inequality uh, at LSE. And, and let me again apologize for uh, <laughs> arriving late. <laughs> Um, we, we have microphones, so we do have some time to take questions from the floor. I'm going to take a range of questions, so if speakers could take note of the kind of questions raised, and then I'll ask each one of them to comment on maybe some of Thomas's remarks and also the questions before we conclude. Okay, so do we have any comments, questions from the floor? I can't believe this, not a single one. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, I, uh, Mike's pointing to someone only, I can't see. Um, where were they? Oh, right, okay, yes, thank you very much. Um, hello. Um, one of the things I was thinking that was perhaps missing from the program and might be a bit of a curveball at this point was um, some commentary on how um, Piketty's analysis relates to issues of sustainability and resource constraints. I didn't know whether that was something we wanted to talk about at this point. I was thinking about it in view of the idea of popu falling populations, which many of us might think is quite good and obviously doesn't work so well. In, in your analysis, it's a bad thing, and I, I just thought about that. Thank you. Yes, and there's another one just further along at the top. Um, Um, hi. So I was, I was, I'm not an economist, and I've tried um, studying macroeconomics and everything <laughs> twice, quite seriously. Never, it never <laughs> happened. <laughs> um, my mind is in more like those, um, what a teacher of mine called once a uh, Mickey Mouse degree. So I'm doing gender studies, <laughs> which are <laughs> not a Mickey Mouse degree, actually. And my question is related to the status of Mickey Mouse degrees. How do I talk to an economist about inequality? How do I access the language if I don't speak it because I find it exclusionary? So what, 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 what can one do? What, what can I do about that? You know, if you, don't, if you don't speak numbers, if you don't speak alpha and beta, you're not being heard, you're being ridiculized. You, you're not doing serious stuff, you're doing a Mickey Mouse degree. Thank, thank you for that. Um, do we have any other questions? Yes, over here, please. Thank you. Thank you. What a great panel. Um, Stephanie, I'm particularly interested in what you had to say. So being someone from the US as well, and actually a lawyer, um, have been really um, frustrated by um, the inability or the, the lack of desire amongst policymakers, uh, politicians, and the courts to um, to deal with a ra the racial inequality that you're talking about. So I'm just, um, particularly on the US side, you know, what would you recommend um, would be avenues given the hostility towards kind of, given the fallacy of the race, race racial blindness kind of uh, approach that seems to be predominate in the US now? Yes, and over here, please. Yes, thank you for those presentations. I'm Pfizer from Save the Children. I guess um, my question is around, so often the way in which inequality is spoken about it is a conflict. There is a kind of talk about economic inequality, talk about gender or racial inequality. So those things are very poorly brought together right now. And in terms of, I was just thinking about examples of countries that are doing well on both. So it's, it's very easy to point to the problems and point to the examples of Mozambique, et cetera. But where are we seeing these things addressed well together? 
Um, we'll take one at the back, then we might have to have a review, because uh, we'll forget. OK, thank you for this time. Uh, hello, thank you very much for the talk. Thank you very much for the talks. They were all really interesting. I love the part of the stories of inequality. Uh, my question is for Thomas, especially. In 2017, there's going to be the automatic tax exchange uh, proposed by the uh, OECD countries that is going to uh, be put in place. Do you think it will have an effect in reducing inequality, especially now that we saw that the conservative government weren't here and then the Republican party is more likely to win in the for in the uh, next U.S. elections. Thank you. Okay, I think perhaps we'd better try and respond to some of those. I mean, um, it's not possible to respond to all of them. I'll just take a brief comment from each of you on those that you wish to comment on. Do I have to do something? Oh, okay, good. So I, I'll, um, the, all were interesting questions. Uh, if I had time, I'd answer them all, but I will address the one on the issue of race in the United States. You know, I ran into an Indian woman recently who talked to me about the globalization of racism, right? Uh, and racism based on skin color, not necessarily being African American, but simply that darker skinned people have less rewards. Um, and I, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on that. I think, uh, first of all, um, you know, I think that what we have shifted to in the context of globalization in which there is increased economic insecurity there is declining male access to good jobs, and that means dominant male act, men from the dominant ethnic group to good jobs. Uh, their failure to be able to fulfill their role as breadwinner, the movement of women into the paid labor force creates tremendous anxiety for men, and we really haven't interrogated masculinity enough. We've sort of put the burden on women's changing roles, but the reality is the gender system is changing. Uh, but in the context of that, I think that what has happened is that uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, we have moved from a system of exploitation of people of color in the United States, I'm speaking about through slavery or other forms, to exclusion as a way to preserve access to jobs for the dominant group. So we have mass incarceration in the United States. Uh, we have high rates of joblessness of uh, black men, and of course, efforts to exclude blacks and other hit groups from the vote. Uh, you know, one of my students just did a project this just a couple of days ago and reported something to me that I actually did not know, and that that is that the unemployment rate of black, young black men in Chicago is 92 percent. I don't think we can. I, I don't think it is difficult then to un, to understand the tensions that we see in the United States, the continued efforts to pathologize, and I think the problem is that. Uh, efforts to address those problems by through redistributive measures through the state, through investments in youth training, through stimulus packages and so forth, uh, or social protection are undermined because white anxiety uh, about, uh, about supporting people who are pathologized and argued to be violent and not to work hard and so on and so forth resonate. And so I think that really the, the um, economic elites have utilized race as a way to reduce the role of the state. I can only say that the way to fight back against that is that we have to stop uh, uh, operating in silos, that mm -hmm. feminist economists have to stop looking at just at gender, uh, that working class trade unions have to stop looking at just at class, and we really have to understand how these inequalities interact and collectively move forward on the issue of inequality. Nana? Um, I'll take the question about uh, potential conflict on different inequalities. I think it is very hard to point to a country that has done well on both, on all forms of inequality. But I think the kinds of countries that are doing well are those where governments have come out of a long tradition of social mobilization, which has included people from different groups. And I'm thinking of Brazil and, and some of the other countries in Latin America. The problem, I think, is that you can get progress on, let us talk about gender equality or on ethnic equality. You can get progress on some dimensions and not on others. So you can point to, let us say, the closing of the gender gap in um, labor force participation without necessarily seeing a closing of the gender gap in wages. And so one of the things that we've seen is there has been some 
closing of the gender gap in certain parts of the world. But in the lower income countries, it hasn't changed. Now, how that matches with closing of gender gaps on other inequality, or of gaps on other inequalities. But there's one thing I think that uh, when Thomas said, talked about the CVs in, in France, and Stephanie talked about how, you know, you know, there's been more progress on gender equality than on racial inequality. One of the things that it struck me is when I've looked at um, in the gender gap in, in wages, it seems to be much larger at the poorer end, and it seems to close at the richer end. And of course, at the richer end, you have privileged women. Race doesn't work like that. You know, it isn't as though at the richer end you've got lots of black people or ethnic minorities. They remain at the bottom part. And so I think it is possible to make a lot of progress on gender because it cuts across all forms of inequality. Whereas race, ethnicity, and all these others are clustered at the bottom. So I suspect you will find much larger gaps at the upper end, if you're looking at racial, racial inequalities, and much lower gaps, perhaps, at the bottom end. Anyway, that's my... <laughs> Lisa? Yes. Um, I'm going to just address your Mickey Mouse degree. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I don't think you should say that, actually. I've done, no, I've I'd love to be in the Gender Institute. <laughs> um, but I suppose, for me, I'm a sociologist. Um, and I've, I think, I've thought very carefully about who is listening and who I speak to. Um, I don't really, I'm not really interested in speaking to politicians or to policy makers. Um, you know, they have their own language and they have their own inner circles that they listen to. Uh, many of us are excluded. Actually, in academia, most our voices are usually excluded because we're not saying the right things. We're not telling them the things that they really want to know. Because what we're doing is usually we're, we're being very critical of what politicians and policymakers do. So I've kind of started to flip that round. And what I want to do is talk to uh, the 99%. And what I want to do is make my arguments to the wider public um, because I think if we can start to make those arguments with the wider public, then we can start to put pressure on the 1%, on the immovables. So I would say use your own language, use your own voice, because I, I want to speak to the 99% and not the 1%. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm just going to throw in um, one, one of my own just before uh, Thomas comes back. And just in response, in response to your point, I really would read Thomas's book if you haven't done, because it is mm, literally yeah. a page turner. And um, <laughs> I, I, I don't recall ever oh, enjoying man. such a book, perhaps <laughs> possibly until its pages. predecessor, the book that was written with a rather similar title in the 19th century. Um, <laughs> but um, but, the, but the, the, the one question I just wanted to throw in briefly is that given that redistribution seems to be problematic and our current government is arguing is going to have a, a range of more kind of tax reductions. Ha, 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 could you say more about how you might think about addressing the ex-ante processes leading to inequality, and particularly what determines uh, social norms that justify these huge increases in inequality, as well as the gendering and racialization of wages? Thank, thanks for that. Thanks. Uh, so le let me uh, start by uh, trying to answer one of the questions about sustainability and, and falling population. You know, I'm, I, it's a very complicated issue, which I, I refer a little bit in uh, the, the last chapter of my book, but I don't have that much to say, unfortunately. I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that we should keep having the population growth that we had in the past. You know, if you look at the world level, uh, so we have uh, we are 7 billion today. We used to be uh, around 600 million in the 18th century. So the world population has been multiplied by 10. You know, I'm not saying it should be multiplied by 10 in the next uh, three centuries, and probably that would not be uh, desirable. Probably this is not going to happen anyway. But on the other hand, the straight decline in population can, can, be, can be dangerous. You know, when you have, uh, when the, the size of a court uh, in certain countries uh, that is being born today is twice as small or uh, 50, you know, 30% smaller or 40% smaller than the court of their parents, 
this this generates very strange dynamics, uh, uh, especially when it comes together with aging, and and that's uh, so it's difficult to get it right. And I think you know I would prefer I think it's better to have a population stabilization or small positive growth than a straight uh, uh, negative um, negative growth and population uh, the decline and and. Uh, um, I'm certainly not saying that's the main reason for promoting gender equality. There are many other reasons, but but uh, that's I think there is some some difficult uh, fine balance to to find. The population growth is not decided by anyone. You know, it comes from all these millions of small decisions which people always take for good reason for themselves. But collectively, this has uh, implication, and and uh, I think we should we should be concerned about the possibility of a, of a decline. Uh, the, let, let me turn to the language uh, language question. So, so I, I, the way I interpreted the question was not only you know what's the language to talk to the top one person, but also <laughs> what's the language to talk to economists, which partly uh, could be the same people as the top one person. But I, I think the question was a bit different. Uh, I, the question, from what I understand, was more how do I communicate with the other department and the people from the other uh, program uh, at LSE or elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I don't know the answer to this question, but I think you should not leave uh, numbers to economists. You know, I don't think, uh, <laughs> you know, I think numbers are too important to be left to, to anyone. You know, I think you have to, ch it's important. You know, of course, there's a lot that can be said without numbers and life stories are, are absolutely crucial material. But that doesn't mean abandoning entirely the numbers to other people. I think what's important is to change the, the, the concepts and to change what we are measuring and to invent new ways to look at the reality and not to take the, the concept like GDP or other statistical concept as given and you need to transform the concept to reinvent. So in the case of inequality, you know, for in the case of gender inequality and the wage gap, you know, sometimes we are being told that the, you know, the, the, the pay gap is only, uh, you know, 10 percent or 20 percent for a given type of job. Now, the problem is that in practice, women don't access to the same type of job as men, and typically they are not promoted to the same responsibility. So if you forget uh, this idea of looking at, at the gender uh, pay gap for a given job, but if you look at everybody, you know, you take all women age uh, of a certain age group and you compare to all men to a certain age group and you look at the gender gap, then it's not going to be 10 or 20 percent. Even today, you know, I looked recently at the numbers for France. Uh, when, when people are 20 or 30 year old, it's only, you know, men on average make only 20, 30 percent more than women. But when you go at 50, then it's 80 percent more, almost twice as much, because typically the men access jobs uh, we know with a lot more responsibility than women. So, the, so, so this is just an example to say that the, uh, depending on what numbers you look at, so you, you, I think it's more, more, um, more satisfactory to change the rules of the game and to change the, the, the type of number we want to look at rather than leaving the numbers to economists. So that would be, you know, my, my uh, advice or reaction. But you know, I, I might be wrong. Uh, there, there was a question about the, the OECD automatic exchange of information in 2017. Is this going to to save the world and reduce inequality? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm afraid no. And, and I think you know it, it depends. You know, I think more transparency in itself is good, but information is not an end to itself. It depends what you do with it and what kind of institutions and democratic institutions and, and fiscal institutions tax policy you have uh, after that. And, and indeed, uh, you know, it makes me a bit uh, strange to come uh, to, to, to Britain a few days after this uh, election, which, uh, which clearly is not going to push uh, things uh, in, in the right uh, uh, direction. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, you know, I think uh, political action is not only about elections. You know, I think many of the most important changes that we see in history uh, came through uh, other forms of political mobilization and political movements and just uh, elections. And, and, I, I, and I, you know, I'm sure it will be the same in the future as well. So in this particular example, you know, what, what, what will happen in terms of uh, international fiscal coordination, I, I, I don't know. But I, you know, I would not take as granted that, uh, that things are going to remain uh, static forever. And you know, I think if you look at the history of uh, 
uh, taxation in particular, it's full of surprise. You know, one century ago, uh, people said that the income tax would never exist, uh, and, and then finally, it, you know, it, it existed, and in some countries, it became very progressive at some point. So th these things are human, uh, social, political, cultural histories, and, and uh, involve uh, social and, and political forces which are uh, uh, impossible to, to uh, you know, to, to say in advance that they, you know, nothing will, nothing will happen. Uh, so the, the, this brings me to the final point about the evolution of social norms, which, I, you know, I think each country has its own um, particular intimate history with inequality because countries react to uh, you know, the narratives that they are being told about their own uh, economic development history by trying to interpret what they see around them and, and facts about inequality in different ways. So sometimes when they are being told that, you know, this level of inequality is necessary, then, you know, they, 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 they believe it at some point and they make comparison with other countries. So certainly in Britain, the comparison with other European countries, you know, the view that uh, that uh, that uh, Britain was was uh, was becoming uh, too egalitarian in the 70s, uh, you know, played a big role in these big reactions that happened under uh, Thatcher going in the other direction. All this, you know, these, these are uh, complicated stories because people try to make their mind and make their opinion about uh, the acceptable level of inequality out of a very limited set of observation and knowledge. And, and I guess, you know, the reason why I am not so pessimistic about the future is that, you know, I believe in the power of ideas and books and, and, and the spreading of information. You know, I think new forms of uh, uh, political mobilization and diffusion of information can, can, uh, can change people's uh, uh, opinion and can change social norms more quickly than we, uh, than we uh, sometimes uh, imagine. Okay. Well, on that very optimistic note, I will um, draw proceedings to a close. And um, I'd like to thank the panel very much on your behalf and be back at 2 o'clock. <laughs>